Welcome everybody to our first or my first parish issue, um, representing St Kilda Shul um, in this crazy time. So what I thought I'd do today, hi Lisa, welcome. What I thought today I'd do today is have a mixture between a bit of chat, a bit of song, and then of course, if anybody wants to contribute, say anything, you guys are welcome. I'd love to hear what you have to say. So first of all, it's not the first time that as Jewish people, we've been forced underground when it comes to learning. Um, throughout our history, we've had many, many times when for various reasons, we've learned in environments that aren't typical. For example, um, sometimes we've been forced through no fault of our own. For example, it might have been during times of oppression. Other times when there have been plagues, there have been sicknesses. And I think that this moment we were are currently is exactly one of those moments in time. So what I thought I'd do is start off with the song. Um, Rabbi Nachman of Breslov teaches in a famous epigram the following words. He says, the whole world is a very narrow bridge, but the most important thing is not to be afraid. So before I delve any further into that, what I thought I'd do is maybe sing. You guys can sing along with me if you want. The song goes like this. Kol haolam kulo Geshev tsar the rabbi think you're singing with me. play this really loudly and at the end of the Yom Kippur War it became one of the most famous songs on the unofficial hit chart in Israel which is really really cool. Anyway one of the things that's a bit unusual about that statement is sometimes it's good to be a little bit afraid. For example we need adrenaline to help us to conquer some of our very for example if a, a marathon runner didn't have this fear or this adrenaline Life. The same thing in military combat, just rely on that adrenaline to get them onto the battlefield in the first place to actually help them win the war. So, there's a bit of a different reading, and I've got it over here. It says the following. What Rabbi Nachman actually said in his great work, Kitei Maharan, was the following. Which means that if a person needs to cross that very narrow bridge, and I always have this image of Indiana Jones in, in his movie crossing that very narrow bridge when the enemies are going to come on the other side and it's going to fall into the water with the crocodiles for those people who like those movies who know what I'm talking about. But what it's saying is that when we need to accomplish something that is difficult, so for example, crossing that metaphorical narrow bridge, what it's saying is that we shouldn't make ourselves afraid. In other words, we shouldn't let ourselves get into a frenzy because that is what is going to prevent us from achieving our task. So a little bit of fear is always important. A little bit of adrenaline pumping through our veins is necessary to achieve those difficult tasks. 
But when we get ourselves, and we see this at the moment, I think in the world today, where we see people getting a little bit hysterical. We see people trying in their own minds doing the right thing by, for example, stocking up for the winter, for example, getting heaps and heaps of toilet paper. But what they're doing is they're creating this fear and they're creating this anxiety in society, which at the end of the, end of the day is going to prove to be and has already proven to be counterproductive. So I think we need to have just that right amount of fear um, and that is going to help us get over or to succeed in and, and get to the other side of this crisis. I always live by the mantra, Gamze Yaavor, this too will pass. It's something that has been on the lips of our rabbis throughout generations. And I think that it's such an important adage. If we just know that at the end of the day, we're going to be okay, it's going to be difficult, but Gamze Yaavor, this too will pass. Anyway, let's talk a little bit about parasha. So this week's parasha um, is, because it's a leap year, is a double parasha, and it is by Yakel Pikudei. And it's pretty much, if we sort of had to summarize it, it's an account of the building, the construction of the Mishkan. Um, the Mishkan was that portable sanctuary, the tabernacle that accompanied B'nai Israel, or was to accompany B'nai Israel throughout the desert until the, they reached the Holy Land. And then it then morphed later on into greater things. And eventually it was, I suppose, the, um, the precursor to the Beit HaMikdash to the temple that stood in, in Jerusalem. So what do we know about the Mishkan? First of all, we know that Moshe entrusted the building of the Mishkan to um, two architects. The first one was Bitzalel ben Uri from the tribe of Yehuda, and to Oholiav ben Achishamach, who was from the tribe of Dan. So first of all, that in itself was a little bit interesting because Bitzalel from the tribe of Yehuda was a very important person by virtue of his birth. So the tribe of Judah, Yehuda, was very, I don't know, I wouldn't say exclusive, but it was a tribe that was very um, well regarded. Whereas the tribe of Dan was a tribe that was perhaps viewed um, as being a tribe populated by people perhaps from a, a lower socioeconomic background. And the choice of these two, although they were both excellent what they did and both inspired and divinely inspired, was very important because what our rabbis teach us is that by Moshe choosing two people from different tribes who were so different in their backgrounds, basically what he was saying was that in order to achieve this task, in order to achieve something as important as the building of the tabernacle, the Mishkan, really what is required is a collective effort, not just from people who could afford to pay lots of money, but also from every single person. And as the Torah tells us very, very, very clearly, who had in their heart the desire to give, every single person was welcome and more so was obliged to take part in this divine exercise of constructing the, the Mishkan, the tabernacle. And by bringing together all elements of society, not just the rich and not just the poor, Rather, everybody who had it in their heart to give, God is teaching us very clearly that in order to achieve big things, we need to do it collectively as a community, all parts of the community getting together and doing what we need to do. So I've just been reminded actually in my own brain of a story that I remember from, from youth movements. I've just got to get it clear. So it went like this. There was a king and the king had three sons. Now the king was getting old and he needed to make a decision as to whom he was going to be ceding his throne to. In other words, who was going to be the next person who was going to be the king after he died. And traditionally it would have been the oldest son, but he decided that he wanted the best person for the job. So what did he do? He chose three rooms of equal size that were all empty. And he commanded each of his sons to fill the room as best they can with something, it could be anything. And he would then judge at the end of the task, they had a week to do so, at the end of the task, he would judge to see who had filled the room in the best possible way. So the first son gets his men together. He's the eldest son. And what does he do? He sends a whole lot of people down to the seashore, to the beach, 
and he gets him with buckets and spades and he gets him to dig up sea sand and he brings it back to this room and they begin to pack the room and they pack it and they pack it and they pack it and they get into the corners and they decide, well, you know what, they're going to drill to the tops and they're going to fill it from the top as well. And eventually they have this room jam packed with sand. The next son decides he's going to do something a little bit different. So what he does is he gets his people to grind, grind wheat to make fine, fine flour as much as he could because the particles are really small. And he gets them to pack, pack, pack this flour into the room. And eventually he gets to the stage where he thinks that the room is absolutely chock-a-block. And the third son seemingly is doing absolutely nothing. Now the king is watching the progress and he's thinking to himself, I'm impressed with my first two sons, my third son, the one that I really love, my little, my little baby, the light of my life. He doesn't seem to be doing very much. But he decides to give the week. And eventually at the end of the week, he goes and he does his judgment. So he goes to the first son and there he walks and he looks through the, the glass because obviously the door couldn't open. He looks through and he sees, this is incredible. He couldn't see a single space. He looks at it from all sides glass windows, all sides, and he cannot see hardly a single space, but he sees a few crevices here and there because sand, the particles are reasonably big. And he says to his son, Kolakabod, you've done an amazing job. Anyway, he then goes on to his next son's room and there covered with flour, jam packed. He looks from all angles of the glass and he sees this is really good because the particles are so tiny. He could hardly even see a speck, but you know, here and there you see something. He goes to the third room, and he walks inside, door opens, and it is absolutely empty. And what happens? He says to his son, my son, why didn't you do anything? What's the story here? I was really hoping that you'd put together something really impressive for me. His son then walks to the middle of the room, and all he sees in the middle of the room is a single candle. He takes a match, he strikes it, he lights the candle. And there the whole room is illuminated. And illuminated with pure light. Not a single, single part of the room can escape the light of that flame. And the king realizes that in fact, it's his youngest son that has outsmarted the other two. And he says to his sons, this is the person who's going to be king after I die. So why was I reminded of that story? Well, I've got to try and remember why I was reminded. But I think really what inspired me at the time was the fact that wisdom does not always come from the most obvious source. And sometimes the way in which we attack problems and we resolve problems might be from a totally different angle to what we think might be the right course. But I think what Hashem is telling us by choosing both of these people from diverse backgrounds is most probably we need both of those types of mindset. We need the mindset of practicality, the mindset of those people bringing the sand and the, and the flower, but we also need the mindset of those people who think outside the square, that idea of bringing that pure light into the room to fill those gaps that otherwise would not have been filled. All right, now how are they going to build this Mishkan? Well, it was quite simple. B'nai Israel were commanded to bring, as I told you before, materials, most of the materials they actually had as spoils that they had taken from the Egyptians as commanded by Hashem before they left Egypt. The gold, the diamonds, the silver, the gold, the copper, the bronze, etc. And it was going to be these materials that were going to be used to build this Mishkan. That was commanded to be an absolutely beautiful, beautiful structure. So it wasn't just going to be something ordinary, but rather it was going to be something that was fitting for, I suppose, God's resting place on earth, even though God doesn't need a place physically to rest, because God is omnipotent, God is omniscient, he is everywhere. We see him, we don't see him, but he is everywhere. Rather, it was a representation for us as humans to be able to have a place that we could envisage God's resting place to be here on earth. So, as I said, the response was overwhelming. People brought in abundance, so much so that Moshe actually told the people to stop bringing after a while. There was such a, a deluge of bringing. And we've seen that in our own community. Just today um, or last night, I saw that there's a, a, a Facebook group that has been established 
where um, a Jewish response to the coronavirus, where there's been on Facebook the most incredible, incredible response to um, people getting together, shopping for the elderly, um, finding food where there is none, helping people, preparations, helping people who might need additional care. And we see the way in which our community galvanizes. And it's not unlike the response that B'nai Israel put forward or that Moshe received after the commandment or the request to bring forward stuff to build the Mishkan. What's very interesting, famously, is Rashi recounts this in one of his teachings, is that the women brought forward their copper mirrors in order to build the, the station where the Kohanim were to wash their hands and their feet. And that in itself, I don't know, I, I always envisage this most intimate of images where the women who, I suppose, it was one of their last luxuries that they had. If you, if you think about it, they're wandering through the desert, there's sand, there's dirt, there's really not much else. But one of the luxuries that they had was, were these, these mirrors, these brass mirrors that they used to beautify themselves and an indulgence um, and just bringing those mirrors to Moshe, I think in itself was such a huge sacrifice. And yet Moshe's response was, was quite unusual. He said, I don't want to take these mirrors because to Moshe, they represented vanity. They represented everything in his mind that he thought was bad. And yet Hashem goes back to Moshe and he says, he says, Moshe, you need to take those mirrors because, and Hashem says this quite beautifully. He says, God says, he says, these gifts for me really supersede all of the others. They are for me the most important. And he explains to Moshe, according to Rashi, he says the following, that during the time when Paro, I think the rabbi alluded this, to this in one of his sermons recently, during the time when Paro commanded the genocide of the Jewish people by destroying, by murdering, the firstborn sons of all Jewish people in the land of Is in Egypt. The husbands decided that rather than bringing these children into the world in misery and allowing them to be killed, rather no, long, no longer to have relations with their wives in order to prevent their wives falling pregnant and befalling such a terrible fate. The women, according, according to our tradition, used these mirrors to beautify themselves in order that their husbands would find them extra desirable and resulting in the husbands and wives being intimate and the women still having children. And Rashi says that it's because of this, in this merit, because of the, the actions of the women, that the Jewish people, to a large extent, were saved, not necessarily from Paro, but also from themselves, from the fear, and we spoke about fear early on, earlier on, from the fear of their husbands. And in this, and for this reason, Hashem says to Moshe, take those brass mirrors and use them because these for me are a precious gift more so than anything else. Mirrors are actually quite interesting. I just can deviate for a second and I'm thinking about it. Mirrors can be used for a number of reasons. Mirrors can be most definitely used for, for vanity. In other words, to keep looking at myself and go, oh my God, how beautiful am I? But also, mirrors on a metaphorical level can be used to reflect to us those things in our lives that perhaps are good, but also those blemishes, those imperfections, those things in our lives that maybe we need to change, highlighting areas in our lives that um, we use as an opportunity to adjust and um, to say, how can I improve? Where can, where can I make a difference, a positive difference? And so therefore, I think the wisdom of the story of the mirrors is not just because the women were meritorious and therefore we should use the mirrors to, to build, to, to use in the Mishkan, but rather for ourselves to understand that mirrors can be used for good and for bad. To, um, on the one hand, as a, as a symbol of vanity, but also to help us to come to terms with issues and to make changes for the better. It's a balance. Life is a balance.
to balance, to help us grow. Now, if you read the parasha, it comes across sometimes as a little bit tedious, not only in itself, but also because the last three parashiyot really have been a repetition of building the Mishkan, how to build the Mishkan. In fact, from the, from the parasha of Truma, which already starts to tell us about the contributions and the building of the Mishkan, we've got this ongoing blueprint of how to put together this Mishkan. This amount of cubits high, this amount of cubits tall, you need to put this year, this there, this there, this there, and it goes on and on and on. And Rabbi Sachs, who we all love to read and to listen to, Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs says in a conversation, he says, why is it that there are only 31 verses in the Torah that deal with the act of creation from beginning to end, and yet, for the describing the building of the Mishkan, it goes on for hundreds of verses. And it's a good question. The whole world was created in 21 verses. The Mishkan, hundreds of verses, it goes on and on and on. And Rabbi Sachs, I think, gives a really poignant explanation. He says the following. God is omnipotent. He's all-powerful. It's easy for him to create a home for humanity. The act of creation was not a difficult act. That act ex nihilo of creation out of nothing was for God nothing unusual. But the challenge for humanity to build a home for God, that is far more difficult. Why? Last week's parasha we read in Kitisa, we read about the destruction of the golden, well, the building of the golden calf and how Moses smashed the tablets. And a lot of rabbis actually say that the, the, the construction of the Mishkan is actually a tikkun, it's a reparation, a repairment for the act of the golden calf. And I suppose Moses smashing the tablets was also something symbolic because really what happened, God and the Jewish people have this tumultuous relationship. We have it today, we had it then. It's an ongoing relationship. And in every single relationship, there are times of crisis. There are times of challenge. There are times when people don't get on. There are times when one person is angry with another. And we see it in, with Hashem's relationships to us too. We just saw that Hashem says to Moshe a few weeks ago. He says, Moshe, you know what? I can't deal with these people. What I want to do, Moshe, is destroy them. I want to get rid of them. And from you and your family, I'm going to build a new people. And Moshe says, God, you know what? If this is the path that you want to go down, I'm not interested in that either. I don't want to be your partner in this. You can block me out of your book because I am intrinsically connected to these people. They are my people. And Hashem, and that was an example of divine chutzpah, if ever we've seen it before. And Hashem acquiesces and he listens to Moshe and he forgives the people. Look at the moment of revelation, the Ten Commandments. Parashat Yitro, that ecstatic moment when the Jewish people are on top of the mountain, well, at the bottom of the mountain, and Hashem is there and he says to the Jewish people, he says, I am the Lord your God that brought you out of Egypt, and here are my laws. And every single person at the mountain, bar no one, got to hear and understand, not from Moshe, not from the prophets, but rather from God himself, that revelation that continues today, but at that moment, that most outstanding moment of pure and utter revelation created this frenzy within the Jewish people. So much so that they decided to accept what it was that Hashem said without even understanding a word. Naseb and Ishma, those famous words of we will do, and then perhaps we will understand, even if we need to, what it is that Hashem had to say. It was that moment of pure ecstasy that drove B'nai Israel to say those words. But then revelation ended. Moses goes up the mountain. And the only way, unfortunately, was down. And what happens? They crashed. They crashed emotionally. They were so, I suppose, devastated by the fact that this high had left and that Moshe had disappeared that they resorted 
to doing the worst thing possible, constructing a representation that they could pray to. Why then does the construction of the Mishkan repeat itself over and over and over again? I suppose what I'm trying to say is that relationships don't rely on those moments of ecstasy. We can't just rely on a single moment of absolute bliss, of near perfection. Rather, it's the mundanities and the repetition of these mundanities, of bringing a coffee, of floating to find out how you are, of talking together, of singing together, of being together, of common conversation. It's those moments, those repetitious moments that really help to solidify a relationship that is long lasting, whether it be a relationship between husband and wife, between friends, between parents and their children, between teachers and their students. It doesn't really matter. Every single relationship relies on those moments of repetition that help to foster and nurture a true and enduring love. I'm going to go back to Rabbi Nachman. He said the following, as well as the whole world is a very narrow bridge, he said the following as well. He said, if you believe you can destroy, believe that you can fix. So what does that mean exactly? Let's say, for example, we look at Moshe after the golden calf incident. What is the first thing that he does? He is so upset, so devastated by the actions of his people that he takes those most precious of gifts that he was just given, the Luchot, the Ten Commandments, and in a Charleston Heston moment, smashes them into bits and pieces. The people look at him and they realize the extent to which they have sinned, the gravity of their actions. But the question is, what happens next? What are the options? Well, the options are that the story ends there. That's the end of the fairy tale. That is the end of the liberation of the Jewish people from slavery and from servitude in Egypt. Or it could be a time for rebuilding. And thankfully, the latter was the way that things eventuated. What happens? Moses is angry, yes. He does a whole lot of things. He grinds the, 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 the tablets into dust and he makes people drink the water and there's lightning and there's thunder and there's, rep there's this retribution, etc. And people die. But he goes back up the mountain and he gets some more tablets. He doesn't end the story there, neither Moses nor God nor the Jewish people. Because that is the relationship. The relationship is between God and his people. The Jewish people used it as an opportunity to rebuild. We didn't want the Humpty Dumpty story where he falls off the wall and smashes and can't be put together again. Because if that is the way that we view life, none of us would be able to progress at all because we all fall and we all break and we all have those moments in our lives where we experience trials and tribulations and when we proverbially smash those tablets or the tablets are smashed because of actions that we've done. But the most important question to ask ourselves is where to from here? Rebuilding is key. And that is why straight after the sin of the golden calf and the destruction of the tablets, we have this repetition of the story of the building of the Mishkan. Not only the blueprint, but also the actual building of it as well. It teaches us how to do it. And then it shows us in the two parashiot that we're going to read, 
exactly what it is that is done. Gives us the recipe, but then it also allows us to taste the final product as well, which is very, very important. And I think if we learn from, from that, we learn that during those times of hardship and devastation that we all experience in our lives, because that unfortunately is the human condition. The human condition is that we were born into a world that is imperfect for a reason. God created the world imperfect so that humanity could be partners in a constant creation, process of creation with God. That is why God created the world. And it is our task to maintain a constant process of tikkun olam, of making the world a better place in order that we could be true partners with Hashem in his creation. The, story, the, 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 the parasha of Pikude is a little bit different. It talks about the, the robes of the high priest, one of the things it speaks about. And it says that people brought these gold and diamonds and jewels, etc., to Moshe, and he used some of the precious gems as part of the ephod, as part of the breastplate, for the Kohen Gadol, for Aharon, and for his children. So along comes a few people, and they ask the following question. And it's a good question. Why in the middle of the desert? There's no one around except for enemies. Why in the middle of the desert is it important for the priests to have diamonds and rubies and emeralds and precious stones dotting their clothing? Why do they have to wear beautiful dyed leathers, absolute luxuries? Why didn't they save that for when they got to the land of Israel, perhaps, and, and they might need to be able to sell some stuff? Why did they indulge in such a way? And I think this is a very, very important, and what I'm going to say now, I think I'm just processing at the moment, I think is really relevant for the situation in which we find ourselves today. There is an adage that cleanliness is next to godliness. And this is something that Jewish people have held close to their hearts throughout, throughout the years. So, for example, during the Middle Ages, where there was the bubonic plague and people were dying in their thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions. The Jewish people, to a large extent, there were deaths, but much less so than within other communities, which led to one of the libels, one of the famous libels of the poisoning of the wells libel. In other words, there were people who turned around and said the reason that the Jews aren't dying is because they've been poisoning the wells of non-Jewish neighborhoods. <clears throat> and many Jews were killed in the name of this libel. This is documented. This is not hearsay. And one of the reasons that the Jewish people were spared a lot of this plague was because cleanliness has always been a big part of the Jewish, the Jewish way because it's mandated. Not just because we feel it, but because God tells us so. We wash our hands before we eat. We're commanded, women are commanded to keep themselves clean. Men are commanded to keep themselves clean. It is a commandment that every single time we put anything in our mouths after we eat bread or um, we always acknowledge the fact that God, God exists and that the food comes from a heavenly source. So therefore, mindfulness is very much a part of the Jewish condition. At the moment, we find ourselves in a crazy world. There is no doubt about it. It's unprecedented. We are hearing stories. I just listened to the radio now. I heard the prime minister speak. He's telling us all these things about big events being cancelled, about now I think it is that 100 people or, 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 or more can't be, in the same, can't be in the same room. And it has very real repercussions for us, not just as human beings, but also as community. We're talking about cancelling shul, postponing weddings, bar mitzvahs, etc. And... I think that what we need to do is understand, just like Moshe did, and just like the Jewish people did, at the time of 
the, at the time of the building of the Mishkan, that the way that we represent ourselves is very important. The Kohanim looked splendid. Why? Because they needed to show the people, not only through their actions, but also through what they looked like. They needed to show the people, this is something that is very important. My job is very important. I represent the most highest of highest of highest of, I suppose, ideals, and that is the Torah. And the people looked at the Kohanim and they were impressed, not just by what they said, but also by how they looked. Cleanliness is next to godliness, the way that we represent ourselves. If you walk past somebody and they smell, you think to yourself, oh my God, I don't want to be near that person. You lose respect. But if you look at somebody, they don't have to be wearing Chanel or Gucci or designer clothing. But if you look at somebody and they're well put together in their own way, in their own style, it doesn't mean to say that you need to conform to the laws of society. But if somebody puts an effort in the way in which they look, they appear, for better or for worse, people will show them respect. If I go for a job interview and I go in a suit and a tie or I go in slacks and a shirt, people will look at me and they'll go, you know what, this person means business. Whereas if I go for a job interview, and I suppose the job depends on, the, the clothes depend on the job as well, but if I go for a job interview and I make myself look presentable, not just sound presentable, but look presentable, People will take me more seriously. There's no doubt about it. Some people might disagree, and that's fine too. Yeah, this is just my opinion. But I'd love, I suppose if anybody's got anything to say, I'd love to hear what you have to say about that too. But as far as I'm concerned, I think that the way in which we present ourselves to the world, I think, has a huge impact on the way in which the world views us. What's that got to do with today's proceedings? Well, for example, we could have just said, Shul's closed. That's it, nothing more. No, that's not what we do. We say, you know what, we present ourselves in a different way. It might not be the same way, but I think the message is equally potent. We will adapt, we will find ways to express ourselves in different ways. And I think on that note, what I might do is sing a song, maybe. Oh. Let me turn on my keyboard. I'm not a great pianist, but you'll all forgive me because it's in the spirit of togetherness. This song, I think, is a beautiful song. It's a song about giving thanks. And it's from our Friday Night Liturgy. Well, it's from the Psalms, really. But we say just before we welcome, before we start doubling Ma'ariv on Shabbat, after Kabbalah Shabbat, and the words are, Tov lehodot Lashem, it is good to give thanks to Hashem. And to praise his name through song. It's one of my favorites. It goes like this. I 
Thank you very much everybody for joining and look forward to seeing you same time same place <laughs> <laughs>